Good afternoon to our CLA family members, clients, community partners, and friends. Welcome back to the live stream. We sincerely hope that all of you are staying safe, warm, and healthy at this time. We have two important topics that we're going to cover today. We're starting the conversation with Bea Petkova, who will be discussing how recent guidance may encourage companies to be more proactive about reassessing transfer pricing policies and to feel more comfortable claiming a loss. Also, we're going to spend time on the latest updates related to PPP and the employee retention credit considerations with my good friend, Jack Rybicki. Welcome. <laughs> Before we dive Thank in you. today, it's, we, it's great to have you. Before we dive in today, we have some housekeeping we want to cover. We have the ability for live Q&A again today during our session, but in order to participate, you must register and log in using the link below me. The questions will appear for you in the audience to see and like, and in doing so, you'll move them up in priority so that we can address them in, uh, with you today. We also have moderators standing by and ready to engage and interact with you in the chat. Um, I also want to let you know about a couple of special events that we have coming up. On March 17th, we have our financial health series being kicked off with some gift and estate tax planning conversations. On March 23rd, there's a session on good cyber hygiene practices for K-12 schools, and we have many others. What you can do is just register on our website. When you're there, take a look for all the events that are coming up, and feel free to click and join anything that is relevant to you. Uh, in addition to these great events, you can also, when you're on the website, be on the lookout for articles and other, other white papers providing some additional guidance. We have a link to some of those in the box below us. And as always, call your CLA relationship. We want to interact with you. So all that aside, let's start off our conversation today with Bea, who will talk to us about what's on the horizon for some transfer, transfer pricing audits and what it could mean for your organization. So welcome to the live stream, Bea. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you about something I'm passionate about. Hopefully I can get you to be as passionate as I am. Uh, although on a not so positive note, um, we are here to talk about transfer pricing um, in the context of COVID, right? And as we know, companies have been presented with challenges due to the global pandemic and extraordinary challenges for companies that operate multinationally on this global scale, they need to carefully address how their uh, transfer pricing policy functions within this changed environment. And now more than ever, such companies with multinational operations need to be prepared and to really reassess their transfer pricing, um, which really means re uh, their intercompany transactions uh, through, let's say, if you have a um, U.S. parent with a subsidiary in the U.K., or it could be vice versa, where you have a U.K. parent with a U.S. subsidiary. And yeah, I not agree. just oh, sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say that's that's amazing, and and I think it's helpful for people to understand kind of what that means and when it applies to them. And I know there was some recent guidance, and that's probably what you were going to talk about. But I just I wanted to make sure that that we hit that as part of our introductory remarks here, right, is to talk about some of that recent guidance on the transfer pricing. Yes, and the reason for this recent guidance also relates to um, our expectations of ta tax authorities, because when um, we have heard even pre-pandemic that IRS, as well as uh, other um, countries' tax authorities, their willingness to be more transparent and to, to be more aggressive when it came to um, studying companies' transfer pricing policies. And now, post-pandemic, we actually expect that scrutiny to be more aggressive. And even today, I read an article about how the IRS plans to um, radicalize, quote unquote, their sources and to e increase their, their sources. And historically, in the past few years, um, their re resources have been on the de decline with the exception of the transfer pricing um, team. So I, we really think that this is going to be a topic that we will be revisiting going forward. And now over to uh, the new guidance that was issued. Now, let me step back and talk to you about the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This entity based in Paris really dictates the transfer pricing rules throughout the world. Um, countries are members of OECD, such as the U.S. or 
as I said earlier, the UK, but they're uh, most developed countries and developing countries are members of this organization. And they really set the, the tone for transfer pricing, how intercompany pricing should be valued, what methods to apply. Um, and now in December of 2020, they issued this new guidance that talks about how companies should be prepared to address um, their intercompany and re revisit their intercompany policies um, within the context of COVID because they know um, that it was very well welcomed, not only by the companies, but by practitioners as well, because we have clients that are out there um, that have questions as to, we're looking at a loss here. How do we handle that type of um, event? Because it's really uncalled for and, and unprecedented. And so guidance was indeed um, needed. Absolutely. Um, and I know there are some further guidance for foreign and U.S. companies. Can you discuss, I know there was a recent IRS FAQ on the matter. Can you spend some time on that with us too? Oh, sure. And this actually, before I even uh, get to that, I think I, I should introduce the fact pattern of having a U.S. distributor that sure. is foreign owned, because this particular fact pattern and maybe you could think about uh, companies that are uh, that are indeed distribute either goods um, or are in the services industry. But uh, there's a, a specific reason why I'm bringing up distributors of tangible goods that are foreign owned because the IRS in the past years have issued their audit campaigns and transfer pricing has made it within the, the uh, it was a, a number of the items in the audit campaigns address transfer pricing. And there was specifically one item that addressed um, this specific type of company, a limited risk distributor that is foreign owned. And um, the IRS, along with other um, tax authorities, do know that this, this will be a particular, particularly tough year for um, uh, what we refer to limited risk distributors. Um, and they will seek to, to um, and they will also, just like any other company, governments have also experienced economic downfall and they will seek to recover revenues. Their one way of doing that, um, that is very effective, is through audits and audits that are focused on transfer pricing because those adjustments tend to be very high. And when um, when these when they now maybe I can transition over to uh, the FAQ that the IRS had issued. That sure. um, FAQ was, and to get back to your question, I just wanted to provide some background too. Oh, I think I um, think that's imperative. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, that particular FAQ was directed toward the preparation of transfer pricing documentation, and they had given an example of a U.S. distributor of goods who had suffered. Uh, from a sudden demand drop. And it was non-pandemic related, but at the same time, they did suffer a loss. And the, IR the most important piece of information within that FAQ was that the IRS was willing to accept the reasons for reporting of that loss. And this is, I don't want to call it groundbreaking, but this provides some comfort level to companies and specifically of limited risk distributors um, that potentially they could consider uh, really reporting a loss. Well, so what can companies do with this moving forward? You know, where where do they go as far as, you know, they've, they, they're considering each of these kind of items separately and, and wondering about operational and exceptional costs arising from COVID and, and how to allocate them. But what do we need to do moving forward, Bea? Companies really, in my opinion, need to be proactive because up until now, small to medium size, size companies were not necessarily on IRS's radar. And mm -hmm. transfer pricing was uh, informally viewed as unnecessary documentation. But there's really so much value into reassessing your transfer pricing. It can really highlight um, tax inefficiencies. It, it can help uh, companies plan for um, cash taxes. Where should profits really be allocated? Let's really reassess how 
uh, we operate globally. How much profit should we have in our UK um, distributor company or how much profit should we have in our US distributor company? And really help align the operational goals with tax planning at the end of the day. And um, something to mention, because of the um, FAQ and um, the IRS's position within it, up until now, taxpayers and especially limited risk distributors, U.S. companies, foreign owned, that were distributors, um, felt the pressure to show some sort of profit. And now with the introduction of COVID and really the economic environment and depending on the industry that they function, there is a possibility for them to really show for uh, this loss. But really, they need to be considerate of the supporting documentation and the analysis because they're going to seek, they're, they're going to need unconventional economic approaches to, to prove that the factors that cause them to be in a loss are justifiable and analytically to arrive there. And going down to the IRS requirements, they do require contemporaneous documentation of companies of any size. And that documentation, um, if impossible for a company to uh, to incur a spend for a full transfer pricing report, they can still incur a spend to at least reassess or have a consulting and have an idea and a better idea as to what they could do to improve moving forward. And more, most importantly, be prepared in case questions get asked, because this is indeed a very, um, it was a very challenging year. Oh, absolutely. And Bea, one thing, you know, as I listen to this and I put myself in the shoes of the organizations who are hearing this, maybe for the first time even, because it does seem like it's evolving. I'm wondering what comfort can we give or, or what can somebody who has additional questions or concerns about this, what, how, can, how can your team help this situation? And thank you for asking that question, because we have been uh, over the past weeks and toward the latter part of last year, we had started receiving one-off questions um, that had alluded to this. And it was, at the time, uh, hard to, to provide more specific responses to those questions. But now, having the new OECD gui guidance, as well as some nuances of the IRS's treatment, and combining those with the transfer pricing uh, regulations and methodologies that we have to utilize. It um, allows us to be, um, to really evaluate how we can help clients and guide them through documenting the effects of COVID and having uh, then be prepared in case there really is a question down the line from the IRS. So, what I would um, am also alluding to is that transfer pricing is not really an uh, unnecessary burden. I really think that moving forward, um, this pandemic is forcing companies to be more proactive. And I really think that we're going to see this shift into companies um, really trying to intertwine their operational effectiveness with the tax piece to that and making sure that they operate at an effective tax rate that makes sense across the board. Absolutely. Well, Bea, this has been just incredibly helpful. I'd like to keep you around for more of the questions that we have coming into the chat. Um, but for now, Absolutely. the chat already appears to be hopping with some questions oh, for Jack Rybicki. So welcome back <laughs> to live stream, Jack. <laughs> So happy to be here. <laughs> it's so good to have you. Um, Jack, let's get the conversation started today with some of the key issues you've been seeing this past week. Well, why don't we start off with something that's kind of near and dear to both of our hearts, which is uh, employee retention credit and, uh, and PPP and, and really how those two are playing together now. Um, you know, I, I know both our teams are extremely busy right now trying to help our clients figure out how to maximize their opportunities, particularly for 2020 still. Um, 2021 is going to be a whole new experience for us, uh, you know, um, with the new rules on the ERC. But now that we have that interplay in 2020, that's where I know we're both spending a lot of our time. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to try to separate, you know, when a company from an ERC perspective qualified 
and then figure out the interplay between the ERC eligible dollars during that period and the PPP related dollars. So, I mean, Jen, maybe you can just uh, give everybody a, a, some a, some insights into when people qualify in 2020, because I think that's the first step in all of this is to see, do we have to do anything, right? Absolutely. And Jack, it's such a good point that you bring up because I think there's so much confusion around, well, the Consolidated Appropriations Act for 2021 set all these new rules, but really other than the fact that we can now take the employee retention credit alongside of PPP, all the rules from the CARES Act as it related to the credit in 2020 stay the same. So you've got you've got two qualifying event opportunities. One, you're either shut down or your business is fully or partially suspended due to a government order, right? And so for that, it would be the dates of the order that are impacting your business that you would look at payroll for purposes of the retention credit. Or if you have a reduction in gross receipts quarter over quarter compared to 2019, um, and it has to be a reduction of at least 50% or greater, um, for any one quarter, you can take the credit for the entire quarter and every quarter after when you pop up to 80, uh, after you pop up to 80% of where you were, but you have to have that, that dip. So in some ways you've got crossover between the covered period for PPP, but it's different qualifying events that are going to get you there. And I think, I think that's important for people to notice, especially when we're starting to look at, well, which payroll, do- you know, what program do I want to put my payroll dollars to? When I'm trying to when I'm trying to figure out, I think somebody called it the Jenga puzzle of PPP and the retention credit, and I loved that. So, yeah. well, it really is, and and you know, it's it's interesting that you know the if you have the the 50 percent or more decrease, you get the wages for the entire quarter that are potent, potentially eligible. But if you're subject to that partial or full government shutdown, it's really only the, that period of time that that shutdown order was in place and your business was impacted, right? And then you've got the different in tre- difference in treatment between the over and 100 employees too. So making sure you do that initial assessment on when you're eligible and what is eligible under the ERC is really the first piece to that Jenga puzzle, right? Now. Yes. <laughs> the next piece of it now is is somewhat mathematical at that point, right? But you know there is some planning to be done, and and particularly for those folks who haven't applied for PPP forgiveness yet, they've got the most flexibility, right? Because you can look at well, what is the right covered period? I can use anything up to 24 weeks now, and so I can you know accumulate just a a, a larger amount of payroll dollars. I can now also consider all of those non-payroll costs to try to maximize those non-payroll costs. And in doing that, you can give yourself a pot of ERC eligible dollars during the right period that you can pull out of the payroll effectively. And so, you know, I've used an example before, you know, if you've got a if you've got a five hundred thousand dollar loan and you've got a million dollars of payroll costs, and then you can layer on to that a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of non-payroll, you can get the payroll dollars that you need in order to get forgiveness down to 60% of that loan amount or only 300,000. So in that case, if you had a million dollars of wages and you only needed 300,000, in theory, you've got $700,000 of wages that you could carve out to use for the employee retention credit, right? And that's that's the situation where you've got the interplay between the qualifying or eligible period of time and the PPP covered period. But I was on I was with a client earlier today, and their 50% decline in in uh, in gross receipts actually occurred during Q4. And as fate would have it, their covered period ended on like September 26th. So they were in a great situation where they didn't have to worry about the interplay because even though both things were in 2020, the periods of time covered by the ERC and the PPP covered period were different. So that that's going to make their ERC consideration in 2020 a lot easier for them, right? Absolutely. It simplifies them, things for them tremendously. And because it happened in fourth quarter, that's great because they already know then that they qualify for it in Q1 of 21. 
as well, yeah. which which is nice if they're planning a second drought loan, right? Which is which is the other thing to think about, right? Because the 2020 conversation is all about how do we plan for for, for forgiveness? Because now it's all passed, and in some cases, you know, we've already applied for forgiveness, and that's that's a whole other topic of conversation, right? But it's really how do we how do we plan the forgiveness discussion in 2020? In yeah. 2021, now it's a question of how do we make sure we don't over over grab the employee retention credit to to somehow jeopardize our ability to to request forgiveness of our PPP loan, which is going to come later, you know, as, as opposed to this flip flop that, that we had in 2020. And that's kind of I, I mean, for me, that's that's the interesting or the exciting part of it is is trying to figure out all the planning. Um, so to me, it, you know, for that particular client, it's it's nice because at least they know they qualify um, yeah. for the credit. No, that was the that was great. I mean, initially we just started talking about that, you know, five thousand dollar per employee credit for twenty twenty, and and when they told me that the decrease was in Q four, I'm like, oh, I have another surprise for you. It was great. I got <laughs> I to be the some work. good news for once uh, to a client on a tax matter. It was great. Uh, I know you get to do that all the time because you save people money all the time. I I don't get that opportunity always. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why specialty tax is fun, exactly. <laughs> and and it's that you know it's it's always the nice conversation sometimes it's it's challenging to get there but you know with all of this too and I know it's not something we necessarily plan to talk about but I, but I think it's important to address the importance of as as we're planning prioritizing these dollars because I think we get really excited that the 2021 credit is so much better for the retention credit you know it's easier to qualify there's more wages that we can look at but at the end of the day Jack it's still I think second seat to the PPP forgiveness dollars, right? Because for one, the PPP forgiveness is essentially it's a free dollar payroll for you, right? Whereas with the retention credit, even even though it's better in 2021, it's still 70 cents on the dollars and you have an add back to the wage expense, right? Which they corrected for PPP, but they did not for this. So I think you know, I, I I think there's a lot to it that that gets people excited, but I also think you know, as excited as we get about specialty tax, we have to also be mindful that some of these programs are just they're just better fits or they're they're better economic use of of the same dollar. So, yeah, you know, part of our job is really to help maximize that. So for sure. And then one other thing I do want to point out, um, you know, because uh, I know Leslie Boyd's in the uh, the Slido with us today, and if we got away from a conversation about this without without letting uh, everybody know about what to do on your tax return with this, uh, she would probably uh, get get upset with both of us. So I, you know, I did want to make sure we covered that in. And in particular, related to the ERC, right? Because that will, as you just mentioned, if you claim the employee retention credit, it does impact the wages that you report on your tax return as being deductible. Because you do have to, you know, back those wages out if you're going to take the credit for them. And so, as a result of that, uh, I'll default to, to Leslie's famous term: "Extend is your friend this year." Right? It gives you enough time to properly analyze your 2020 expenses, right? There's a whole host of reasons, but the ERC analysis is yet just one more reason to look at extending your tax return this year. Give yourself enough time to deal with all the uncertainty that we have out there, whether it's PPP forgiveness and basis issues, um, interest on PPP loans. I know we don't know all the rules around that yet, making sure you've done a thorough analysis of employee retention credit. And then you've got the new partnership rules that are really the basis for the extend is your friend philosophy anyway, because if you extend, then you get, it's easier to fix things than if you file on a timely basis. And so there's just a whole host of reasons that to think about doing that. So when you are talking to your tax preparer this year, keep that in the back of your mind. It's not necessarily just a tactic to move work out of a, a busier time for your tax preparers. There, This year more so than ever is a year that you should do it because it's in the best interest of the taxpayer as well. Well, it really is. I mean, especially as we await for await more guidance, you know, we still yeah. don't have FAQs about Consolidated Appropriations Act impact on the employee retention credit. And I just, you know, it is an uncomfortable conversation to have for, you know, 
for anybody, why am I extending? What does that mean? But to your point, it's so much easier to extend than amend. And if we have to go back and amend, I mean, that can really create some issues. So I mean, which are manageable, of course, if we need to, but um, if, if we can be mindful in our planning of planning out of the different scenarios, I think that does make a huge difference um, and, and positive impact for the clients, especially this year. Yeah. So, so I could talk about this all day because <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's what I do. It's, it's, you know, my kids will tell you it's why I spend 16 hours a day sometimes in front of the computer. But I know there are some other, you know, kind of nibbling ducks here when it comes to um, PPP, starting with this PPP holds hold codes procedural notice and I want to know why some of the borrowers are starting to have the whole you know have the hold codes now and what they're supposed to do about it so sure yeah, we yeah, may me, come back to more ERC questions but because <laughs> I like them but good. let's, let's go good. there yeah so you know we did get a procedural notice um, that came out uh, a little while ago and it, it gave us a lot more insight into what was going on at the SBA um, back when PPP came out and and they clarified that um, you know they really empowered the banks to originate the loans right the banks uh, you know did a lot of the work on the front end validating the payroll sizing the loan they did the know your uh, customer uh, routine and everything and there wasn't a lot that was being done on the SBA side to validate the information coming in. The SBA was trying to get the money out as quick as possible. They were approving loans, um, you know, largely in reliance on the banks. Now, what happened after that, though, when the SBA had a chance to breathe, was they implemented a number of analytic protocols that they they wanted to put in place to look for things like ineligible borrowers things that were indicators of fraud. Um, as you remember in the first round of PPP and in PPP too, there were a number of folks that were ineligible. For instance, if you had declared bankruptcy or defaulted on you know, another SBA loan, or if you had certain criminal activities in your background. And there's just a number of these federal databases out there that were available to kind of bounce the PPP data off of once they got past the initial flurry of activity around let's get money out right and they put out you know 525 billion dollars in a relatively short period of time and so you know it's hard to fault the sba for ordering their activities the way they did but but what has happened since then is that they did run all of these protocols right so they've they've created these these different tests that they're running all the data for or through now they're looking at things like the do not pay list that's out there, um, the debarment list, for instance, at the federal level um, that prohibits the federal government for doing business with certain um, individuals or companies because of, uh, of a variety of factors. And, and as a result of doing all this analytic analysis, they classified certain loans as on hold. Now they didn't tell you you were on hold because they knew that they were gonna get a chance to do that when you came in for forgiveness. And so that was when they thought they would disclose the hold codes to you. Now with PPP2 coming online, the, the need to disclose the hold codes earlier in the process um, is out there because uh, you can apply for PPP2 before you get forgiveness for PPP1. And so, you know, the, the good thing is in this procedural notice, they, they defined what the different hold codes are, um, and they also defined how to resolve the issues that cause those. And so there are a number of hold codes, like, you know, things like, well, we think that maybe one of the borrowers had a, a criminal activity that, was, that would preclude them from getting a loan. Um, well, the bank could resolve that one. The bank could have an inquiry with the borrower. They could resolve that, get the appropriate documentation and submit it. And as long as the bank was comfortable that that condition didn't exist, they can clear the hold code, right? So there's a, a number of those kind of things that the bank can take care of for you. And what that'll do is that'll allow you to do two things. Once that hold code is cleared, then you can apply for PPP2 and now you're clear to go apply for forgiveness as well because you that, that issue is behind you. Now there are a number of 
hold codes that need to be resolved by the SBA. There's a few that they're saying, bank, I need you to collect this information, but this one is you know, either sensitive enough or maybe nuanced enough that we want to be involved in the clearing of that hold code. And so I would encourage everybody to read that procedural notice. Make sure you understand um, what kind of hold code you have on your account if you have one. And so the first thing to do, obviously, is reach out to the bank. These hold codes are now in the uh, the portal that's out there and your banker can go in, run a report, see if you have any of these hold codes associated with your account, and then you can proactively work with the bank to resolve those. So, you know, that's our bit of advice on this uh, is reach out to your banker. Even if you're not doing PPP2, reach out because it'll affect PPP1 forgiveness and you're going to get that much of a head start. Um, but if you are doing PPP2, it'll it'll make that process go a lot easier as well. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of PPP2, and I think you kind of alluded to this, has there been any impact of the process process changes at the SBA on these PPP2 applications that we need to we need to yeah. talk about while we're together? Yeah, you know, it's uh, I think the SBA has said, okay, this time we're going to go a little bit slower, right? Before we put all this money out and then we're kind of inspecting in the quality, so to speak, or looking for fraud on the back end and we'll we'll deal with it then. Right now, what they're doing for either new PPP1 loans or PPP2 loans, they are being proactive. So when you submit these new applications now, all of this analytic stuff is happening in the approval process now. So where we had clients that were submitting an application, it would get approved by the bank and then the SBA would issue a, a loan number within potentially you know, 12 to 24 hours before. That process is definitely taking longer because they are running the data now through these different analytic pro programs and they're doing more testing on the front end to make sure that they're not putting out loans to, uh, you know, to individuals or companies that are not eligible uh, for those. And so, you know, you can expect the approval process to take a little longer now, maybe three, four, even five days in some cases, because the SBA is going to be running these scripts and they may issue you a, a hold status or an unresolved borrower status which would require you to you know, address the, the hold code again in order to be able to move forward with the loan. So um, it, is, it is stretching out the approval process now, um, but it will make sure that the borrowers that ultimately receive loans in this, in this current round are ones that you know, should be eligible. Yeah, I think that's super helpful. I know I know we're getting close on time, but I, there's a question that I keep seeing all the time, and I know we've even discussed it internally, that I think would be incredibly helpful for you to just clarify some of the confusion around the difference between the affiliates and corporate group. Can you, can you let our listeners kind of know and understand what those differences are and when this applies? Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, but you know, there is a term that was introduced uh, called the corporate group. And the only time a corporate group um, comes into play is when you have multiple entities applying for a loan and there's a cap on how many, how much you can get at a corporate group level. So the definition of a corporate group is simply multiple entities that are owned by a company more than 50%, right? So if you've got five companies and somebody owns 50% or more of each five of those companies, they're deemed to be a corporate group. And then across those five companies, the maximum loan they could get under PPP2 collectively is $4 million. So individually, each one of those is limited to a loan of 2 million, but collectively across the five, they're limited to 4 million. That's where that corporate group comes into play. Now, the affiliate guidelines, which you know don't necessarily track ownership, right? You can be an affiliate because of ownership, because of management, because of contract. There's a whole host of reasons you could be deemed to be an affiliate. The affiliate rules come into play because you have to measure employee count at the affiliated group level, and you have to look at the gross receipt decrease, that 25% required decrease 
that is also measured at the affiliate group level. And so it's just important to know that your affiliate group might be different than your corporate group and when those two things apply. I think that's super helpful clarification. And like I said, I know we're getting close on time, but I do want to bring in Bea for one more question that's coming in from the audience that could really help. Um, Bea, could you just comment on how often organizations need to update their transfer pricing documentation? Um, and thank you for that question, because I would say that it's a pretty frequent um, question that I get. And Typically, the requirement is, as I had previous, uh, previously mentioned, um, per the regulations, taxpayers have to have, assuming they have intercompany transactions, the documentation needs to be prepared on a contemporaneous basis. So there has to be documentation annually. Now, the format of that documentation, um, the typical fact pattern in an ideal world uh, we would probably recommend to have a what we refer to a full transfer pricing report within year one. And assuming that there have been no changes to the functions of the entities and the intercompany transactions occurring between the related parties, then in year two and three, we could perform an update to that report. But let's say in a year uh, like 2020, where um, certainly some new circumstances were introduced, um, I would highly encourage companies to really revisit their policies now because um, it usually is frowned upon when you flip flop within years, meaning on the treatment of your intercompany pricing. However, this year really presents an opportunity as well as uh, through this reassessment, as I talked earlier, because companies can really evaluate how they operate globally and how they can improve their global footprint. But more, most importantly, depending on uh, the materiality of their intercompany transactions, they can be prepared for an audit, but also set the tone for the years ahead and um, potentially uh, identify changes that they can make to their operations and the overall transfer pricing policy. Yeah, that just seems so wise to me and really appreciate your insight there. Well, I could geek out on all this stuff all day long, I have to tell you. So thank you both for really engaging with me and making this such a fun, fun live stream for me personally today. And hopefully everyone in the uh, audience enjoyed listening as well. Um, but unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. So thank you, Bea and Jack, so much. It's been great having you here. Thank you, Leslie and Christine and all our moderators actually in the chat today. I know, I know you've been fielding a ton of questions, so really appreciate your engagement and interaction. And of course, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. We love bringing the content to you and having the chance to knowledge share with you. Encourage you to contact us using the contact us button on claconnect.com and register for our future sessions and just engage with us. We enjoy that so much. So mm -hmm. until next week, uh, stay safe, healthy, and warm. Thanks so much. Thank you.